Okay, let's unpack this. If you are designing safety systems for modern vehicles, you know, ISO 26262 is basically the rule book. It really is. We've gone through parts one to eight in previous deep dives. Now uh, we're diving headfirst into part nine. Our sources, they call it the uh, like the ultimate analytical backbone of functional safety. And what's really fascinating, I think, is how part nine connects almost every single phase of the standard. It's the technical engine, really. How so? Well, it takes safety goals, which start out as, you know, just objectives, and turns them into requirements you can actually verify, mm -hmm. measure, test, is how you prove mathematically that you've done enough risk mitigation. Exactly. So our mission today is to trace that whole analytical flow. It kicks off with defining the risk that's ACE or ill determination. Mm -hmm. Then it moves through proving redundant solutions, work that's decomposition. Oh, wow. And it wraps up with uh, some really rigorous analysis checking for hidden weak spots. We're talking dependent failure analysis. Right. So part nine gives you the methods, how to determine ACE cells, how to break down those high ASIL requirements, how to evaluate independence, which is key, and perform that DFA. Making sure the right level of safety rigor gets applied just where it's needed. You could almost think of Part 9 as the quality control manual, but specifically for safety integrity. If your goal is ASIL D, Part 9 spells out the analytical homework you absolutely have to do. To justify every design choice, every bit of spending. Precisely and make sure the safety requirements are truly proportional to the actual measured risk out there on the road. And that journey, it starts with the hazard analysis and risk assessment. Yeah, AJ Ray. The goal seems pretty straightforward. Identify hazardous events if a system malfunctions, and then assign an automotive safety integrity level, an ASIL. Right, from A, which is the lowest rigor, up to D, the highest, or sometimes QM, just standard quality management. Okay, so how does that ASRA process actually begin? Well, it has to be structured. First step is item definition. You can't assess risk if you don't know exactly what the item or system is. Makes sense. What does it do? What are its boundaries? What does it depend on? The sources use a great example, an electronic brake control system, an EBC. Okay. So for that EBC, you define its function, its limits, and crucially, its dependencies. Things like wheel speed sensor data, CAN bus communication, control inputs from the ECU. Got it. So once the item's defined, what's next? Hazard identification. Exactly. Now you look for the malfunctions. What could go wrong? Loss of function. Incorrect function. Maybe it works, but at the totally wrong time. Right. So sticking with the braking example, a hazard might be what? Unintended full braking? That's a classic one. Or maybe loss of braking entirely during high-speed driving. Or even something like brake pulls sharply to one side. Okay, so you've identified the hazard. Now comes the core analytical step from part nine, right? Assigning the risk level. Yes, and this uses the SEC classification. You classify every hazardous event using three factors. These determine the A cell, severity S, exposure E, and controllability C. Let's break those down. SEC. They seem key to the whole safety case. Severity, S, that's about potential injury. That's right. How bad could it be? S3, the highest level here, means life-threatening or fatal injury. SEO is no injury. Okay. Then exposure, D, that's how often you're likely to be in the situation where the hazard could happen. Exactly. Likelihood of encountering the operational condition. E4 means high likelihood. Think driving in heavy city traffic yeah. or maybe constant highway driving. Those are frequent conditions. And controllability, C. This sounds like where the human factor comes in. It is. It asks, if the failure happens, what's the chance a typical driver can actually avoid the harm? C3 means it's difficult or pretty much uncontrollable for the driver. So if you have, say, S3 life-threatening plus E4 high exposure and C3 uncontrollable. Then you are absolutely landing at ASOL D. Highest integrity level required, no question. And that structured analysis, that SEC system, it ensures we don't end up over-engineering something simple, like a warning light, maybe. Exactly. A warning light failing might be an inconvenience, maybe an ASLA or even QM. Uh -huh. But the core steering system failing, that's clearly going to be much higher, likely ASL D. It makes the safety effort and the cost proportional to the real danger. Okay, so let's say we've done ASLA. We've got an ASL D requirement, highest level. Now the engineering challenge really kicks in. How do you hit that incredibly high safety target without, you know, 
bankrupting the project. Ah, uh, yes, the cost challenge. And this is where part nine gets really interesting because it offers this uh, this elegant solution called ACIL decomposition. It is elegant, mm -hmm. and it's defined basically as risk reduction through redundancy. Mm -hmm. It's often a massive cost saver. How does that work? Well, instead of building one single, super complex, incredibly verified ACIL D component, which is just astronomically expensive to develop and test, right. you can split or decompose that ACIL D safety requirement across two or more independent elements. Mm -hmm. And each of those elements can be designed to a lower ACIL, like say ACIL B. So it's like saying if the main system fails, this separate secondary system catches it. And together, they achieve the needed reliability. That's the core idea. Let's use that example. Prevent unintended acceleration. That's clearly an ASLD safety goal. Definitely. Part nine lets you decompose it, maybe into two channels. Channel one could be an ASLB throttle monitoring function. Channel two, maybe an ASLB brake override function. Mm -hmm. If either one of those works correctly, the hazard is stopped. Okay, but it can't be just a free pass, right? Just slap two cheaper bits together. The standard must have strict rules. Oh, absolutely. Trick rules and specific math. And we should probably clarify the notation people see like BD. What does that actually mean? Good point. What does BD tell us? So that notation is vital. The letter outside the parentheses, the B in this case, tells you the integrity level required for that specific element, how rigorously that channel needs development and testing. Okay, so A cell B level rigor for this element. Right. And the letter inside the parentheses, the D, tells you the original safety goal this element is contributing towards. So in this case, an ASIL-B element is helping satisfy an overall ASIL-D goal. Ah, that makes perfect sense. B rigor contributing to a D goal. Exactly. And part nine lays out the specific decomposition formulas you must use to keep things mathematically equivalent. For ASIL-D, for instance, you have options. BD plus BD or CD plus AD or even DD plus QMD. And ASIL-C can be decomposed too. Yep. ASIL-C can be BC plus AC or CC plus QMC. But underlying all these formulas, there must be some core principles. There are. And the absolute non-negotiable is rule one, independence. Those decomposed channels, those elements, they must be sufficiently independent. Meaning what exactly? Meaning no single fault, no common cause, can take out both channels at the same time. If your ASIL-B throttle monitor and your ASIL-B brake override both fail because of the same software bug or a shared power supply glitch. Then the decomposition is basically worthless. Completely worthless. You've lost your redundancy. And rule two is equivalent risk reduction. The combined architecture, considering its redundancy and its ability to detect failures, has to statistically deliver the same overall safety level as that original single ASLD requirement would have. Okay, so independence is the absolute foundation. But how do you actually prove it? Prove that no single fault or common cause can knock out all your safety mechanisms. That's where diversity becomes absolutely critical. You can't just have two identical channels. So diversity is key. What kinds are we talking about? Well, you need multiple types. First, functional independence. The safety functions themselves should be logically separate, doing the job differently. Like how? Okay, so maybe one channel uses software monitoring to detect overspeed. But the redundant channel uses a completely different approach. Maybe a hardware safety mechanism that physically cuts a power relay if the speed goes over a certain threshold. Same goal, prevent overspeed, but different means. Got it. Different approaches. What else? Then there's physical independence, Dang. literally separating the hardware. Okay, like different circuit boards. Exactly. Separate PCBs, independent power supplies maybe, different clock sources, even physically routing the wiring for redundant sensors separately so one little short circuit doesn't take out both sensor signals. Right. Avoiding those single points of physical failure. And don't forget, logical independence, especially crucial for software, this tackles systematic failures. How do you achieve that? You might use different programming languages for the two channels or different compiler tool chains. More commonly, you use strict partitioning in the software environment, memory protection, running safety functions in separate protected tasks. To stop a fault in one piece of software messing up the critical safety function. Precisely. Preventing interference. But that brings up a practical challenge, doesn't it? So many modern systems use complex ECUs, right. shared microcontrollers, shared platforms. If safety channels share hardware, how do engineers prove what's called freedom from interference? FFI. FFI is absolutely vital in those shared resource scenarios. If you have two safety functions running on the same multi-core processor, you must prove they won't interfere. How? You need to prove memory independence, 
One task absolutely cannot corrupt the memory space of the other. And you need to prove execution time independence. Meaning one task running late can't delay the safety task. Exactly. You have to use analysis like worst case execution time or WCET analysis to prove that even under worst case load, your non-critical tasks will never delay a critical safety task beyond its required timing window, its diagnostic interval. That's a really high bar for evidence. That intense focus on FFI seems directly connected to the need for dependent failure analysis, DFA. Mm -hmm. If we've decomposed things, shouldn't they be independent anyway? Why this extra DFA step? Because just designing for redundancy doesn't automatically guarantee independence in the real world. DFA is specifically designed to hunt for that Achilles heel. That one shared vulnerability may be an environmental factor or a subtle design flaw that could take out multiple independent elements together. Okay, so DFA finds the things that defeat redundancy. Yes. Dependent failures happen when multiple elements fail due to a shared cause, not just random chance. And part nine talks about specific types of these dependent failures we need to worry about. It does. Three main types. First, the most well-known, common cause failures or CCFs. Give us an example of a CCF a design team might miss initially. Okay, a classic CCF is some single external factor hitting multiple channels. Think really high temperatures affecting components on two separate boards similarly or strong electromagnetic interference, EMI, corrupting signals on both redundant communication paths at the same time. Ah, environmental factors. Exactly. Or, a very common one, a single shared power supply failing. If both your independent safety channels rely on the same power source, its failure takes down the entire redundant system instantly. DFA forces you to identify that shared power supply as a potential common cause. Makes sense. What's the second type? Cascading failures. This is where the failure of one element causes another element to fail. It's like a domino effect. Can you give an example? Sure. Imagine a short circuit happens in some non-safety part of the system. That short causes an excessive current draw. This pulls down the main power rail voltage across the board. Now, maybe your safety critical watchdog timer relies on that voltage being stable. And the low voltage causes it to malfunction, like yeah. resetting the main chip unexpectedly. Precisely. One initial failure in a non-critical part cascaded through the shared power rail into causing a failure in the safety mechanism leading to a system reset. That's a cascade. Okay. And the third type sounds the most sneaky, latent multiple point faults. They are insidious. These are situations where you have two or more faults already present in the system, but individually they aren't detected and don't cause immediate failure. They're latent. Hidden faults. Right. They only become hazardous when they combine or when another fault occurs. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why diagnostic coverage is so important. How so? Well, imagine channel one of your redundant system fails, but it fails silently. The system doesn't detect it. It's a latent fault. Now you're effectively running without redundancy, relying only on channel two. You think you're safe, but you're not. Exactly. Then, sometime later, channel two fails due to just a random hardware fault. Boom. You've lost all safety functionality because the first failure was latent and undetected. DFA forces you to analyze for these scenarios and implement mechanisms to detect those latent faults. Maybe through periodic self-tests or dedicated monitoring? Yes, things like that. Or external watchdogs that monitor both channels. The goal is to minimize the time a fault can remain latent. Okay, so we've designed these hopefully independent, resilient systems. We've done DFA to root out common causes and cascades. Now we need to actually prove the safety mechanisms work. Absolutely. You need proof. Safety mechanisms are those features, hardware, software, maybe even processes that detect faults, mitigate them, or prevent them from occurring in the first place. Like watchdog timers, we mentioned those, or maybe plausibility checks in software, comparing sensor values. Good examples. Mm -hmm. Or things like end-to-end -end communication protection using CRCs or message counters to ensure data doesn't get corrupted between sender and receiver. And part nine requires verification that these mechanisms actually do their job. Mandatory verification. You have to prove they work under real world fault conditions. And the primary method for this, dictated by part nine, is fault injection testing. So not just simulations, you actually inject faults. Yes, this isn't just theory. Engineers have to physically or logically inject realistic faults, simulate a short circuit on a pin, intentionally flip a bit in memory, Corrupt a CAN message. And the goal is to see. To ensure the safety mechanism reliably detects that injected fault and does so within the required time limit, the Diagnostic Test Interval, or DTI. You need proof it works fast enough. And it's not just about if it works, but how well it works quantitatively. 
Part nine demands metrics, right? Exactly. Quantitative evidence is essential. Qualitative claims like, it's pretty reliable, don't cut it, you need numbers. And these metrics often come from detailed analysis, typically using FMEDA, failure modes, effects, and diagnostic analysis. It's a structured way to look at potential component failures, their effects on the system, and how well your safety mechanisms can detect them. It helps calculate these key metrics. Okay, so what are the main metrics Part 9 focuses on? Well, a primary one is diagnostic coverage, or DC. Simply put, it's the proportion of dangerous hardware faults that your safety mechanism can actually detect. And higher ASALs need higher DC. Definitely. For high integrity systems, ASAL C or D, you're aiming for high diagnostic coverage, typically 90% or even higher. We also hear about, say, failure fraction, SFF. How does that differ? SFS looks at the proportion of all faults that are either safe by design, meaning they don't cause a dangerous failure, or are detected by the diagnostics. It's used to classify the overall safety capability of a hardware element. Got it. And for the really high levels, like ASAL D, there are even more specific metrics. Yes. For hardware targeting ASL C and D, you need to meet specific targets for two metrics derived from the FMEDA, proving effectiveness against different fault types. The first is SPFM, the single point fault metric. A single point fault metric, what does that measure? It measures how well your safety mechanisms cover single point faults. Those faults that could, on their own, violate a safety goal if not detected. For ASL D, the SPFM target is typically 90% or higher. Okay, high coverage for those direct single failures and the second one. The second is LFM, the latent fault metric. This directly measures the system's ability to detect those hidden, latent, multiple point faults we talked about earlier. The sneaky ones. The sneaky ones. For ASL D, the LFM target is usually 60% or higher. Meeting these SPFM and LFM targets provides that hard quantitative evidence that the necessary rigor driven by the ASOL and analyzed through Part 9 has been effectively implemented and verified. It's the statistical proof of safety. So pulling this all together, what does this really mean for you, the listener? Part 9 seems to be the critical translator. It takes functional safety from being just high-level goals into something concrete verifiable, measurable requirements. Absolutely. It's the framework. It lets engineers aim for those top safety levels, like ACLD, but achieve them using practical strategies, often involving redundancy with lower complexity elements, if, and it's a big if, if they can rigorously prove independence and systematically mitigate every plausible common cause risk through analyses like DFA. So the key takeaway seems to be... The safety we depend on in our cars isn't guesswork. It's not just about over-designing everything. Not at all. It's built on a structured, quantifiable analysis of those three core factors, yeah. verity, exposure, and controllability. And if any one of those changes, the whole engineering equation shifts. Which actually raises a really interesting final thought for you to chew on. If we look ahead to future tech, say fully autonomous driving systems where the human driver is completely out of the loop, how does that change the controllability metric C in the HARA? That's a fascinating question. If a human can't intervene, does C effectively become C4 uncontrollable by default for many scenarios? And if that happens, does it mean certain hazards automatically jump to ASLD, almost regardless of the severity, just because there's no human backup? It forces us to really think about how we define and assess risk when the technology fundamentally changes the human role, doesn't it? Yeah. How does technical risk assessment adapt? Something to consider. Definitely. Well, we really appreciate you joining us for this deep dive into the analytical core of ISO 26262 Part 9. We hope this breakdown was useful. Hope so, too. We'll be looking forward to exploring Part 10 in our next discussion.